All right, so I last ended with this little passage of the Talmud. <clears throat> it's kind of a standard um, known passage. Any, any um, one has a, a Jewish education within the Talmudic study class, for the most part, um, is going to be exposed to this. And um, to reiterate, as I mentioned, the context was there was a particular type of oven and um, whether or not it was appropriate for use, essentially, and uh, for, over its ritual status. But that was just used as a um, as a prop to get into a greater point. That miracles, or even God himself, can't nullify what's already God has written, the Torah itself. It's not in heaven. And... This idea that God could smile and say, my children have defeated me, my children have defeated me in, in a battle of wits. This is something you would never see in an Islamic or a Christian uh, theological discussion. I'm not trying to make a judgment on it or, you know, but what, what I'm saying is, is that it's, it's, it's a very unique approach that is particular to um, the rabbi's approach. Um, and... If it seems kind of a little uh, offensive would be the strong word to use, but jarring. Um, it wasn't, just as a side note, some Jews didn't feel comfortable with this. Remember, Jesus himself was kind of, um, this, these are the kind of things, things that he seemed to be kind of um, calling into question. Well, there became another set of gr uh, ju uh, group of Jews, which still exist, called Kararites. Um, Karaim, and uh, it means readers. They're like Protestant Jews, so to speak. And it's thought that they had arisen in about the 7th and 9th century CE in Baghdad and possibly in Egypt. And it's also very possible that they were they, they came in response to Islam. Um, because you know, with Islam, you know, you simply have like the word of God and they kind of take on that more literalist interpretation of just following the the letter of of the of the Bible itself, not uh, um, the the rabbis. So they reject and they still reject the Talmud and the rabbis, but they have the Hebrew Aramaic scriptures that they focus on. So, for example, that passage where it says, "Don't boil a baby goat in its mother's milk," they say that's exactly what it means. That's it. Um, and so. Um, they also, though, have their own set of traditions, though, that in a sense you could still say are extra biblical. Okay, um, I'm not going to get into that too much. I just wanted you to be aware of that particular um, uh, set of issues there within Judaism. Um, and now I'm going to walk into something a little outside the box. I'm going to show you some things that, like, honestly, you probably are not going to be exposed to a lot of other places. And, um, um, I think it's interesting history that just doesn't get talked about. So there were actually non-Palestinian Jewish states in history. And what I mean is non-Judea, like, like Jews that actually had political power in states and other parts of the world. One was the Himyarite kingdom, which is in Yemen, the place where all of the contention is happening right now in current politics. In the 5th century, so this is uh, shortly before the Prophet Muhammad from Islam comes into being, several kings of Himyar are known to have converted to Judaism. Yes, converts. Um, just as it was rare that we hear about when we talked about the Hasmonean dynasty forcing to convert people to Judaism, it's also very debated, very much debated about if Judaism ever had really a missionary type aspect to it for the most part the agreement is no but then there's these kind of situations that well force us to have to kind of rethink that because here you have arabs in yemen um that convert to judaism and not only that they actually were uh, killing thousands of christians and trying to fo force them to become jews it's true um and um by the way, in Israel, there is a street named after him, Joseph um, Dunuas, I believe. Yes, um, King Dunuas, okay, literally has a street named after him, and I believe it's in Jerusalem. So he is known somewhere in the world enough to get a street named after him. 
Um, and he's a controversial because he did actually slaughter some Christians and try to force them to become Jews in this late period. There was an Ethiopian uh, king um, named Elsabam, also known as uh, Caleb, who intervenes on behalf of the Christians there, uh, or to get his foothold in the region. Again, you know, what are the real intentions? But that's another debate and topic. And he was sainted for defending Christians against the Jewish Arab King Lunuas. And this is actually Saint El Sabam, the saint um, pictorialness of him. And here is the Jewish Arab that he's conquering. Um, yeah, not really known about that much. Um, interesting, right? And then you have the topic of the Khazarian Jews. And I'm going to need to point out a little bit. There's, there's some controversy also over this topic, but... At some point in the last decades of the 8th century, on the early 9th century, the Khazars, which were, um, you know, they, they were a, a royal no, nobility that converted to Judaism. And um, they became a part of the general population. But it's debated, did just the royalty convert or did the whole entire population and they're in an area of, of Eastern Europe, um, they would have been actually Turkic uh, origins. Um, they were, um, and they established one of the largest uh, polities in medieval Eurasia. They're talked about by even other Jews, but when the Mongols come, they get destroyed, and the history of them is obscure. Now, what's interesting about this is that this shouldn't seem all that controversial. It should just seem interesting that we have a Yemenite king that's converted and we have a Khazarian Jewish uh, uh, um, uh, kingdom that's converted. But the debate is whether or not that the majority of Eastern European Jews are actually people who came from Israel or, or, or who fled since 70 and in the 130s, member of Bar Kokhba, or are they descendants of these converts? And um, so some anti-Semites, well, what's interesting is that when this information was first being discussed early on by Jewish writers, they were trying to tell Europeans, look, you're anti-Semitic and you're, and you're saying there's something wrong with our race, but we're just uh, a religion. We're not a race. And then now anti-Semites, there's, there's groups that call them the Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews, Khazarians. And that they're the fake Jews that that this this is how they argue it, and that um, they're imposters trying to like pretend that they have the covenant of God. So it gets controversial like that in the modern sense. So it's it's so the whole topic of Khazarian Jews and, and what it means gets intermingled with a lot of um, crazy politics right now. Okay, I just want to point that out. Um, and I'm saying that it's not established. I don't know what extent. Um, that modern the, the Jewish population um, really would be descended from them or not in the, in, in the European context. Okay, um, and then lastly, I'm going to Kahina, Kahina uh, uh, Adia of the seventh century. She's a Berber, which would be in modern uh, Algeria, and Ibn Khaldun, who is a famous uh, uh, 14th century Arab historian, he wrote. Um, some of the Berbers practiced Judaism, which they had received from their powerful Israelite neighbors in Syria. That sounds somewhat missionary-like, right? Among the Jewish Berbers were the Jerua, who inhabited uh, Ores, I, I'm, I'm saying the names wrong right now, <clears throat> the tribe of Kahina, who was killed by the Arabs in their first conquest. Well, who was she? She was a Berber Jewish um queen or princess who fought off the Islamic conquest but lost. Um, so this then goes back to the whole uh, topic of um, Judaism and conversion. Okay, and um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to have one more lecture to synthesize everything, bring it all into the fore, and then um, that will be it on this section.